name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text today tells us that Jesus, when confronted with thousands of hungry people, turned to his disciples and he curtly said this, you give them something to eat. Jesus was well aware of the dynamics of the movement that his father had started way back in the beginning when the universe was dark and void and the spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters and we saw what love does in the face of darkness. Love calls forth life. It was life called forth, then life called good, then life called out, as our ancestors were charged with moving out from that garden into the world. To be fruitful, to multiply, you give them something to eat. And from the beginning, God's word and God's work has had its challenges in the selfishness and pride that takes up way too much space in the human heart. But because God's image is also in God's people, so is God's love. It's not a love that is settled or stagnant, something that we keep hidden in our hearts as a place of personal contentment. No, this is a love of assertiveness and action, a love that creates, a love that sends out and seeks to be fruitful and multiply. You give them something to eat. And so Jesus faced with the needs of thousands of weary brothers and sisters out in that desert as the dusk set in and those tummies started a rumbling, could do nothing other than what love does. Jesus looked out at that crowd, and as our text tells us, he had compassion on them. Jesus looked out and he saw the lovable, adorable, and needful crowd, and their suffering became his suffering. Their discontent became his discontent, and their problems became his problems. And as the text tells us, he had compassion on them. And so Jesus healed. He sent forth the power of love, and he bowled over every pain, every sickness, every malady that got in the way. Jesus called forth love, and then he called forth others, telling his disciples, you Give them something to eat. You let the generosity of God that flows through me flow through you. You let the abundance of God that flows through me flows flow through you. You let the love of God that flows through me flow through you. And this, my dear brothers and sisters of St. David's Episcopal Church and Resurrection Episcopal Church, is what I see at work in your midst. You meet the need of hungry people. You meet the need of that hurting person. You meet the need of the lonely, the homeless, and the marginalized. You form community that is known for hospitality, for encouragement, for kindness that finds its root in love. I know you're calling each other on the phone. I know you're sending each other emails. I know you're writing each other notes. You have great interest in caring for your neighbors here and far away. For I know that you are also well aware of the current trajectory of the universe, bending toward love and fairness and equality in this very moment. You willingly and lovingly are witnessing what is going on in our world, and you are playing your part in an awesome renaissance that is being birthed. Your caring for each other far and near not only inspires me, but it fills me with hope. I am hopeful because you're not being passive. You're being active. I'm hopeful because you're not sitting at home crying victim to a devastating virus, economic uncertainty, and racial unrest. What you're doing is staying connected with each other and with the world. What you're doing is reaching outside of yourselves and helping others. And what we're doing together is helping to usher in this new era. As we all know, this is an unprecedented time of momentous striving toward social equality, the likes of which we've never seen before. The Reverend William Barber refers to it as the third reconstruction and inflection point in time when the spirit of the nation clashes with the myth of our history. Our nation is radically reconsidering the stories that we've been telling ourselves, what they are and what they've made us into. And it's not just black people who are being affected. It's not just people of color who've had enough. We white people are awakening and we're not happy with what we're seeing. 
for it is a history that has hidden our shameful choices of greed over goodness, selfishness over fairness, individualistic achievement over communal flourishing. We are seeing anew how we've been created to love and to serve, to find our deepest contentment in our highest calling. We are seeing how we've lost our way and how we're finding it. Like never before, this true history is being named in pulpits, in marches, on TV shows, in podcasts, and pop music, as many of us are discovering our mutual complicity in the perpetuation of unjust and unequal systems and traditions and mores in our society that need to stop and change and reform. I'm hopeful because we're not the only ones who are seeing this. We are surrounded by a multitude of witnesses who are saying the time has come. Enough is enough. We can make a better tomorrow. This is a time of freshmen and renewal. This is a time to reach toward those things that bring us goodness and life and to put away those things that have brought us hatred and death. We are becoming more aware of a persistent and malevolent inequality that has tainted our institutions, our authorities, and our souls that can only take so much. And so now our nation is growing, groaning and writhing and rejoicing and recalibrating in this time, this place, this moment. God is setting off an alarm, my brothers and sisters, awakening us to the radical inequalities of our age, and this time we are not going to hit the snooze button. This time, we're not going to be so quick to backslide. We're not going to be so quick to retreat. We're not going to be so quick to move back into a comfortable rhythm of what was because we're now seeing what can be. I am hopeful that this time, as we lift up the heroes and sheroes of our American heritage, as we focus our intentions on what it really means to be equal, to work together, to take the fundamentals of democracy, respect, honor, selflessness and communal goodwill to heart that we can see ourselves and our nations rise to a newer, higher and more liberating and loving plateau of moral consciousness and societal ordering. Our history is rife with successful climbs, albeit don't we know too well that there are also accompanying slides. 1865. We ascended the plateau of the Emancipation Proclamation when the North won over the South and freedom for all won over the enslavement of many. But of course, only to see the deceitful ugliness of white supremacy drag us down a little bit. Here birthed an age that may have criminalized slavery, but it gave it a new name as former slaves became least convicts, arrested on charges of simply being black and Jim Crow was created and given a long, long life of oppression, degradation, hatred, and inequality. But we rose again and we ascended another plateau of the 1968 Civil Rights Act, where we had a dream, pass some laws. And just as slavery had run its course, so did least convicts. But discrimination, housing, education, opportunity, that had not yet run its course, nor as we face today mass incarceration, the result of too many laws aimed at too few people. And we scratch our heads and we wonder, do black people really break more laws than white people? Or do white people, the ones who pass the laws, have a tendency to make laws that target black people? This would not be the first time. And so today you and I remind ourselves that we are part of a grand trajectory that arose from those dark primordial waters at the, in, 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 at the intention and the action of God, who promised a liberty that humanity has had a hard time grasping. It's always taken us a long time, my friends, to learn that I do best when we do best, to treat one another with dignity, with respect, with love, to set aside our love for things, and to replace that with a love for people. We really want to know how to survive COVID? Two things. Take it day by day. Live one step in front of the other. And the second, make other people a bigger part of your life. God will take care of us when we take care of others. And we're getting there. We're learning. We're growing. We are seeing the eternal hand that created and sustains with unbelievable patience and steadfastness. 
laboring on to the work of perfection. And we have so much to do on our part. You give them something to eat. Changes like this come about much more quickly when we're disciplined, when we realize that our small, tiny actions actually join together with those of millions and millions more to set into place real change. When we read, watch, think, and learn, when we put education before entertainment, when we take part in the democracy that God has given us, voting and speaking our minds, doing the good and needful thing of more fully participating in our political lives, seeing the good work that can be done in this good time. And all of us know that we have help, for the Lord is near. It just seems that God won't quit until we're there. As much as we try to hurt ourselves, our planet, each other, God has not given up on us. How many of us here can think of a time when we were down and out and God somehow, some way, got us through it? God continues to send us good words through good people. One of whom was laid to rest this past week, John Lewis. Did you see the funeral? That passionate preacher, civil rights leader, and U.S. congressman. From him, you and I learn important lessons on how hatred and fear must be answered with love and hope. Lewis's commitment to justice and the betterment of our world spoke to us from the grave this week. It was not enough that he lived 80 years devoted to justice and to peace, but he arranged for an op-ed to be published in a newspaper on the occasion of his burial. Part of it read like this. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and to stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it's your turn to let freedom ring. My brothers and sisters, you give them something to eat. Amen.